going to get rid of these fish, pick up my wife, and all of a sudden one wave catches us and we start surfing down it. And at the bottom, it turns us really hard to the right. And I look up and like the front bow of the boat is like dipping under, like scooping water. And I'm like, dude, there's no way we're coming back from this one. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have a very special episode for you because we are gonna be telling you a little bit of our backstory. Which is why it. we are outside right now, yeah, right? Yeah, you get, a, get out of the office, get out a little break bit. the routine. You get yeah. out in the sunshine, you get the wind on you. Yep, exactly. And it's so appropriate that we're in the great Alaskan outdoors because much of our story has been kind of this, um, almost like this struggle, this tension between you know, living in this place of Alaska, this Alaskan culture, and doing something so off base compared to what everyone else is doing, <laughs> yeah. and going the complete opposite direction of the grain, um, and, and jumping into digital marketing, jumping into e-commerce marketing. Totally. So we're not gonna rush this, we're I'm gonna just, settle in. I'm gonna might... say something real quick too, before mm -hmm. we're deep into it, is part of my goal today is to, make you lose your train of thought <laughs> as you're as you're in your flow it's something i'm good at you know i kind of cut in you know, as you're talking and then I, I bounce out and want you to take it so that's that's gonna be going on a lot today well hey uh, it's happening right now isn't it i appreciate that very much Daniel. it's happening right now uh yeah so i what i think you know is this is going to be something uh it might take more than one episode to fully tell yeah. this story because there's a lot of components but let's just jump, uh, you know, right back to the beginning where we're talking about, you know, something as little as um, Daniel as a boy growing up in Alaska, what his lens of the world was. And oh, we're how going way back. Heck, how in the heck did he end up in e-commerce marketing? That's a good question, Rob. So, yeah, I grew up here in Homer, Alaska, born and raised, and my father is a fisherman or construction on the side. Um, but I have four little sisters too. I have quite the amazing upbringing where in the summertime, since I was like three years old, I'd actually go out uh, commercial fishing with my dad and go out on the boat and I'd be gone for like a month at a time for, as a three-year-old. I got three-year-olds now, man. I'm like, I would never bring them on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Just out in the nice, icy waves <laughs> uh, and i got seasick super easily so i was always you know just throwing up all over the place but as a kid it was like super fun out there with my dad commercial fishing and stuff mm -hmm. but that's the that's kind of the lifestyle i grew up in where i'd go fishing all summer come back hang out do homeschool in the fall winter and then kind of repeat that and it's funny because these last like four or five summers it's like first summers that I've actually spent in my hometown I'm like oh dude this is why people love it here so much because the <laughs> summers here are so nice but anyways growing up in that environment you kind of develop wait, 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 wait. Oh. so t tell me what's life on a boat like you know as this three-year-old as this ten-year-old I mean how big's the boat what is your what does a normal day look like yeah so when I was three I mean it was a really small boat <laughs> and so because he had upgraded his operation. Uh, he, yeah, right? he, yeah, he'd upgrade as, as I grew older, you know, and as he was more successful in the industry. But when I was three, it was a pretty small boat, meaning it was like 42 foot boat mm -hmm. with four guys living on it for three months. Tiny space. Mm -hmm. And most of that boat is the back deck where all the net sits and you can load all the fish on. So the living quarters are pretty small. So mm -hmm. you're just out in the elements most of the time fishing away and then you go in and eat and go to bed basically but a lot of crazy stories of like I remember as a little kid you know like getting these massive sets mm -hmm. and when you get a big set of fish on a saner you have to roll those fish into the fish hold somehow mm -hmm. and I remember sitting up top it's called the flying bridge but it's like the top of the boat where you can drive from and we would get a big set and when you're rolling them aboard the boat like tips way up so I'd just be like clinging on to something as a little kid as everything's like sliding down Whoa. and like... 
then fish are coming up, you know, after I realized the boat wasn't gonna roll, it was like super exciting, you know, but scary at the same time. Uh, but yeah, it was pretty wild. And then you'd get situations where you'd catch a salmon shark every now and then and have to let that go. And, and I, I think an important piece of the story is that uh, you're not just on any fishing boat, you're on Tom Stafford's fishing boat. And so those big sets, those are happening all the time because your yeah. dad is like one of the, you know, locally famous, like- He's a legend. Oh, he, he's, he's a, a legend. fishing legend. He, he has the world's largest uh, herring set. Yeah. How, how, how big was that? 1,500 tons. 1,500 tons in, 1500 one, in tons. one set. So you picture this, you know, you're, uh, are you a teenager, low 20s? For that set? Yeah, you tell know, us I about was, the set. I was not there for that. Oh, you were. I was 18 and I just gone out of state. <laughs> <laughs> you missed the big one. I freaking missed the big one after dedicating my whole life. So, so <laughs> to get just, into something like just that. say why why it's so addicting though, because that's worth a lot of money and it happened that quick, right? Yeah. So why it's so addicting? For yeah, for people to like want to be in fishing, you know. Everyone yeah, wants I mean, to get you live for set. those moments in mm -hmm. fishing, it seems like. You know, you'll grind away all season, getting the boat ready, catching minimal fish from time to time, getting up at 4 a.m., putting your wet rain gear on, going and stacking the net, and kind of having a crappy day, but all of a sudden you get a really big set, and it kind of makes it all worth it in that mm -hmm. moment. It feels like awesome. And then at the end of the season, fishermen have this thing where they only remember those beautiful big set <laughs> moments that pumps them up for the next year but it's kind of that addictive thing where like that 1500 ton set was worth a million dollars you know mm -hmm. so and it, it, and it happened over like an hour over an hour yeah exactly i mean then he had to get all the fish and pump them off and take them to town so that was like a three-day process but <laughs> the set itself Crazy. was like 20 minutes and he wrapped them up you know so so young Daniel, he grows up fishing for uh, commercial fishing legend Tom Stafford. Experiences these amazing experiences and learns to be a part of a, a culture where you go out and you earn what you work for. 100%, yeah. And you know, the harder you fish, uh, the harder you work in the off season, the more construction projects do, the, the more you earn. And so it's very much um, just like a, a very work-based, like physical manual labor based culture. Yeah, exactly. And so even though we didn't start in the same place, it's actually kind of where our stories come together because that's after I married your little sister. <laughs> yes, you <laughs> Is did. when I, you know, purchased my own fishing operation. Oh, well, well, got well we can't grind. we can't just skip over your whole childhood. Yep, that's true. Nice, <laughs> nice try. <laughs> So that's where our worlds kind of collide, you know. I grew up in that realm, mm -hmm. fished up into my early 20s, but somewhere in 1920 range we met, and that's when you were getting into that too, and you married my sister. But let's rewind your yep. life a little bit and talk a little bit about your upbringing. Yeah, so my upbringing was quite a bit different. Um, born in Montana, and my dad is, uh, He's an oil painter. He, yeah. He, he's an artist. Yeah. And so it's it's similar in the way that it's like provision came to our family seasonally. Yeah. You know, if he sold a number of paintings, we'd be doing pretty good for a while. But then there would be a string of time where, um, you know, maybe he, something would happen, or he'd fall out of a gallery, and we'd be we'd be pretty hungry for for a long period of time yeah but the other thing the the similarities I draw between your story and my story is like commercial fishing is you know there, there's a lot of freedom there too because yeah. you go fishing you do your thing but then in the off season you know you have some freedom over your schedule yeah. you can go do a trip stuff like that so being an artist is the same thing my your dad, family I mean you did a lot of that right like traveling yeah. painting moving going all over the world as a family kind of having these yeah. experiences that aren't normal. Yeah, and, and even experiencing a certain amount of pride for being kind of like this nomadic, free artist family, which which was really cool for a long time. We traveled all around Montana, um, 
you know, eventually the, our, our journey brought us up to Alaska. There was a period of time in there where we were kind of living in a, in a tent. We got stuck in Canada because we ran out of money for a while. Yeah. Um, you know, even into other countries, Costa Rica. And so, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of traveling in there and it was always kind of this journey towards um, just going where my dad felt inspired and, and he would normally paint his surroundings. Mm. Uh, As a kid though, those that feels so normal. It feels like this mm -hmm. big adventure, but I know looking back sometimes, those moments were could be hard for you as mm -hmm. well. What was a hard situation and so, how did that? So I think when it started to get painful for me was when I was uh, just like wanting to have connection when, when we'd move all the time. You know, I had my brothers, but you know, you'd have to leave your friends. I, yeah. I think we counted one time we lived in like uh, like 17 or 20 different homes over the sp space of like just, you know, a, a few short years, something like Dang. that. But then, you know, growing up, I really loved sports. Like I got, I went all in, all into that. I loved uh, wrestling, football. Um, so eventually, so we came up to Alaska. I told you we kind of had some rough spots in there. We ran out of money a couple times. And so I'm like 10 years old, we're in Alaska. I'm playing football here. I'm, I'm wrestling, two-time Alaska state champion. <laughs> <laughs> went, went to like, uh, you know, Western regionals for, for wrestling and stuff like that. And then, you know, come middle school, you know, we kind of get uprooted again and we go to Oregon. Mm. And then I'm doing like middle school and high school and, and I go all in like on, on, on football and, and you kind of get a, a band of brothers in, in team sports. And so, you know, when it, my sophomore year came around, my parents were gonna move again. And uh, you know, my exit from the home basically happened um, my sophomore year in high school because I didn't want to leave the kids that I've been playing football with for, yeah. you know, six years. And we had a really good team, you know, we had won a lot of titles and stuff like that. So didn't want to depart from that. So I moved in with a friend my sophomore year. But somewhere in that story, I adopted this idea that I was on my own from there. And, and it started this journey of me like, and it's nothing against my parents or, or even necessarily a criticism on how we grew up and, and the choices they made. But at some point in that journey, I adopted the belief that I was like an orphan mm. and that I, and it and it triggered this thing inside me that propelled me into this like workspace environment where I thought like I was not worth anything if I didn't earn it and like mm. it was all on me to, to make it happen. So then, you know, a, a few more years pass, I, I finish out high school, uh, toward the end of my high school career, my parents then moved to Costa Rica and I'm just kind of left, you know, floating, don't really know what to do. I spent some time in Denver for a couple years there. Um, and then my older brother, Scotty, who's a good, good friend of yours, was fishing with you, yeah. fishing for your dad. He invited me up to, he, he encouraged me to come up to Alaska again to go fishing. Because at the time, you know, as, as you know, a couple young 20 something year olds, it's like, dude, we can go, we can make all this money. And then we're going to Thailand. We're going, to, <laughs> we're going to Indonesia. And so I was invited into that culture where it's like this work hard, play hard. And, and honestly, like, dude, I'm so grateful for those years. Yeah. So that's where our stories come together, right? Um, I came up here to go fishing. Uh, you, were, you were fishing on another boat, I was fishing on another boat, and then we did some traveling. Yep. I fell in love with your little sister. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, now then you guys have four kids together. <laughs> yeah. And then eventually, so you fought, you meet your wife in California. Yeah. I, I asked Brittany to marry me. And now we're trying to morph this culture of work hard, play hard with, I have a family to provide for. I don't want to leave. I can't necessarily get up and go travel but we're still going all in to this uh, fisherman construction lifestyle yeah. because that's all we knew. That's how we provided for ourselves up until now. Yeah, and it's funny, and it's right what's when been we, laid out before us, right? So Yeah, exactly. So that's what we thought it, it had to look like to make good money in this town because mm -hmm. you look around and that's kind of what this town consists of. Fishermen, people working construction or people working in the oil field. Mm -hmm. And you think, okay, to make money, I have to do one of these things. But when we both got married, we did the same exact thing. You did it first, but you got married bought yeah. your own fishing yeah, so, operation because you're so like, dude, oh, now I got to provide. Didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I'd worked as a deckhand on several boats, did, did construction. Um, 
married Tom Stafford's daughter. Yeah. We're on our honeymoon. Phone's off. Somehow Tom gets a hold of us. He's like, hey, I got a sick deal on a great boat. <laughs> Dude, literally uh, committed to buying a boat like on our honeymoon. Got back from our honeymoon and went into Whittier. <laughs> and we're just, just like, this place gets like 20 foot of snow. And we're like towing this boat out of Whittier to bring it up to Homer or bring it down to Homer uh, to work on it and get it ready to go to go fishing. So, you know, but take on like 300 grand worth of debt, jumping into fishing, which, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty skilled. I, I'm, I can work hard. I can be a good deckhand, but I wasn't quite ready to be a captain. That didn't matter. We actually, um, we actually did pretty dang good fishing. We did that for like five or six years. Uh, the first year we did it together, which again, these, these worlds are coming together. And at first we're making it, we're making it work. The first year it was me and Brittany fishing together. It was two of us on a 30 foot boat. And dude, like for us coming into it, not knowing much, at least for me, Brittany grew up fishing as well. Yeah. So she's like a teen. It, you know, when she was in high school, she'd go out in the summer and make like 40, 50 grand. Yeah. And then like spend that on, on clothes and <laughs> and like taking people out to dinner for the rest of the year. And Whatever, high that's, school that's like do. That's like normal. <laughs> uh, but she actually knew quite a bit about fishing. So you mix that with like a pretty good work ethic and, and we made some stuff happen. We were like one of the top five boats for the company we fished for, even in our yeah. first year. It worked good. Uh, but then she got pregnant and then it's like, she's not coming fishing anymore. So now it's me leaving for three or four months at a time, you know, to run our own boat. But then even to make ends meet, you know, maybe I'm gonna go take on a deckhand job in the winter, do some cod fishing, some crab fishing. There was a, there was a time I broke my finger in um, between two crab pots and it swelled up, cut off the blood flow. My finger literally froze. Like I could flick it against, <sighs> I could Bro, flick how do you even still have a finger there? I don't know, but I, I <laughs> don't came back. I don't feel much. So, anyways, lots of like <laughs> brutal, much. brooding, brutal fishing stories. So, that was it. And for the foreseeable future, uh, that was where we were gonna be. And I'm kind of looking at it, and I'm like, dude, I just like I'm very family driven. That was one thing that I really loved about my childhood is, um, you know, with my dad being an artist, he was so available to hang out with us, to adventure with us. We were always going hiking, rock climbing, uh, eating all our meals together. You know, he worked out of a studio right by the house. So some, literally every day I was homeschooled and we had a really tight knit family. I love that. And so the thought of me going off and leaving my family, even though I'd say the fisherman culture is very much family based, um, it just still felt, felt hard to me. Yeah. So I'm in it five, six years. What are you? What are you doing at this time? At this time, <laughs> you're already a couple years in, but then I get married and I have the same thoughts and feelings like, oh, I got a family now. I can't just fish for my dad the rest of my life. I got to get my own boat and start making this happen on my own. Almost this kind of pressure I put on myself just based on my surroundings, you know? So I did the same thing. We got back from our honeymoon. I bought a boat, went $350,000 in debt on top of being newly married, you know, you're already, that's stressful. already stressful enough mm -hmm. trying to figure that, that realm out, but then going into all that debt. And then on top of that, once we're, oh, we already knew this. So we were also pregnant when we do that. And the due date was right in the middle of the fishing season, which is hard because you can't miss fishing days. Cause you it's can't such, miss a day. Cause there's a day you might go make, uh, you know, fifth a quarter of your season in totally. one day. Yeah, it's such a short sh season, kind of high stakes. You have to be there, show up when the fish are because mm. they're not there all year. You better not sleep. Better not sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so I, all that was going on, got the boat all ready and went out fishing. My wife was due in like a couple months. So I was trying to fish as hard as I could, you know, catch fish and then I was going to fly home for the birth and then go right back out fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know how this story ends, but we we were doing really well the beginning of the summer, catching lots of fish, having a good time. You know, it's still stressful being the new captain. You know, the first year you're like figuring so much stuff out that you never even thought about. And a lot of pressure being the son of Tom. A lot of pressure on the son of Everyone's of looking They're at like, you, hey, you're the top this, of the town. Can this kid perform like his daddy? <laughs> and he did. He did. He did. <laughs> he can. No, he can. <laughs> so 
So I started off with a crappy, crappy boat because that's all I could afford to get into the fishery. You know, you're already extending yourself, borrowing money from everyone, mm -hmm. trying to put this operation together, hoping that it all works out. Mm -hmm. So one day we were, you know, we were having a good season. We we're heading into town and we had about I interrupt you. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt your story. Go. But I've heard these podcasts, like of entrepreneurs talking about some of the riskiest things they've done in business and some of the biggest failures they've had. Mm -hmm. But dude, up here, it's absolutely normal to go <laughs> three to five hundred thousand dollars in debt with not a single guarantee that a fish is going to show up in the summer. Not only that, but and it's normal and like that's what people do here. Yeah, totally. You think like, about like a risky business investment. It's like, why don't you go buy a boat, expose yourselves to these elements, hope that fish come up and hope that you're going to get paid for those fish. Yeah, get get paid a fair, fair price. And uh, it's all competitive, right? It's not like, hey, there's 10 boats and 100,000 pounds of fish. Let's all take 10. It's like Tommy's going to come in and scoop 90. And the rest of the other people are going to split the remaining ten. Like it's competitive. Like whoever catches the most wins. Yeah. So, anyways, competitive. Yeah, high risk. I mean, I pulled equity out of my house, used all my savings, was borrowing from everywhere, and it like all came down to like, is it going to work this first year? You know, can I make mm. enough money? So, anyways, heading back into town, uh, my wife was just actually getting to one of the ports, so I was going in to pick her up, and. You know, the, the wind started picking up pretty good and we're in this, it's called Valdez and it's kind of this arm that's right in the mountains with glaciers all around, but the wind's starting to pick up really heavy right on the stern of the boat, the back of the boat. And didn't think much of it, you know, felt, pretty, felt fine. It was like six to eight foot waves, which isn't massive. Been in that many times, but we had the fish hold about one third full of fish. Mm. And in that fish hold, there's dividers so they can't slosh back and forth and like tip the boat, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And we we're riding pretty good. We we're actually watching Walking Dead season four, you know, just <laughs> cruising into town, <laughs> going to get rid of these fish, pick up my wife. And all of a sudden one wave catches us and we start surfing down it. And at the bottom, it turns us really hard to the right. And I look up and like the front bow of the boat is like dipping under, like scooping water. And I'm like, dude, there's no way we're coming back from this one. Like it felt totally fine until that one moment, boom. And, and it went from like chill. Went from chill, we're, a couple we're guys hanging with hanging the out. guys, we're watching season dead, <laughs> season four of The Walking Dead. Crushing it, catching fish. Yeah. And all of a sudden we like, we're all in the cabin of the boat and we all like have this oh shit moment where we look at each other and we know the boat's rolling. And so I'm on the uphill side and I have my phone in my pocket luckily, but I open up the window and I climb out the window. So the boat's rolling here. The boat's and rolling. Daniel's in his chair and he's climbing. I'm on the uphill side. So I climb out the window as it's rolling and walk across the boat until it's all the way upside down. And I just keep walking and I'm standing on the bottom of the boat. Right when that happens, I call my dad because he was fishing about a mile away. I luckily had my cell phone in my pocket, called him, and you know, usually don't have service out fishing, but luckily we're close enough to town to where we did. And he came, he got in his skiff, started hauling this way. But meanwhile, I'm standing there and I'm just looking in the water, like praying that the crew pops up, you know, because I was the first one out. And sure enough, one guy follows me out the window and he's swimming, struggling, you know, and he swims back, goes to the skiff, which Dude. is the small boat, and is standing there. And it seemed like forever where I was just scanning the water, looking for people, like, are they all gonna pop up? By this time, the net's kind of all floating around the boat, which creates this web people are having to swim through. And people, you know, the crazy thing is lots of people die in rollovers. It's like super common, you know, so those, those thoughts are going through my head. And then sure enough, the second guy pops through the door. He was able to open the door as it was rolling and swam out. But there was a moment where there was three of us out and there was the fourth guy missing. And that's actually Patrick who now works with us. So he's gonna come on the next week and he's actually a, an integral part of us scaling the agency. Uh, he, he he, really maybe is. he'll be able he's to share beast. some of his side of the story and 
uh, we'll get into that part eventually. Yeah, but. totally. But there's a part where us three crewmen, we all made it out and we're all just screaming for Pat, even though, you know, we, he, we knew we, he couldn't hear us. We we're just in that panic mode, screaming for him. And I was debating, like, do I jump in? It's like this murky water, like, try to swim through the window and find him or just wait a few more minutes, see what happens. And it probably wasn't as long as it feels, but it felt like, you know, five minutes or something. But mm -hmm. it, this probably all happened a lot quicker. And Patrick uh, was, what happened was, is he tried to follow a guy out the door and it was underwater, upside down, and the pressure from the water rushing into the cabin slammed the door on the guy in front of him and actually caught his legs in there. He was able to squirm out, but it took his pants off and everything with him. So he pops up in just his underwear. We're like, dude, why are you in your undies? <laughs> but that's what happened because the door had depanced him. And Pat just saw that slam right there. And he said he like he's a big dude too. He like tried to push the door open and it wouldn't move at all, it wouldn't budge. It's just so much pressure. And the cabin's filling up with water. There's oil in the boat, like all just a mess. Can't see anything, disorientating. And he, he's getting to the point where it's like the movies where the water's like rising up, like Titanic, you know, where they're taking their last breath. Mm -hmm. He did that, took his last breath, went down and the door just like opened up. Pressure had equalized out, just opened up for him. He swam up and we're like, oh, thank God. And dude, Pat's like pretty big dude, like 300 pounds, like tall. <laughs> six five, six, six yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's big. big strong guy and I'm like he can't like reach up and climb onto the boat because it's so high dude and, and so, he just had to like swim out of a sinking boat yeah he was so he like, was so dude. drained already and it's cold water no like, one no one could have... grab the boat and climb up uh -huh. like they had to swim around to the skiff and hop up dude and even in the summer you don't have like too long in that water before you start getting hypothermic yeah. and your limbs don't work and totally. it's like it's pretty hard so he was in that state and I <laughs> I freaking like got up to the edge of the boat and I like man grabbed him right here. I had so much adrenaline pumping and I just like ripped him out of the water with one hand and like came up, flopped on the boat. And he's just laying there like <gasps> trying to catch his breath and stuff. And one more guy was still in the water just swimming there that couldn't climb up. I'm like, Pat, help me. So he comes, pulls him up. And right about then as we all get on there, we're like all looking at each other like, oh, we survived this. like pretty crazy moment that we just experienced together dude and thank god you got out with your phone in your pocket yeah like what would have happened if it was just sitting on the ledge or something like yeah and i then, know i couldn't have called and you guys had help on luckily the, way. the boat like stayed floating once it rolled you know it didn't sink so eventually someone would have found us but it's still like a little bit of a black bottom sticking out of the water it's hard mm -hmm. to see especially when it's rough out so i was super glad and like right when Pat got up, a few minutes later, my dad pulled in with the skiff, got us all off and you know, at that point we're all hugging each other and went through that crazy experience. And, but also realizing, dude, we just lost everything that was in there. So many personal items, so much hard work we'd put into the boat, getting it to that point, mm -hmm. losing the net. The boat was way underinsured. Uh, so it basically ended up in this, situation where the insurance company bought it back and I resold it it was this whole deal but basically I lost all my money that I'd been saving up pulled equity from my house uh, had just enough to pay the crew back and still all these pending bills went into lots of credit card debt and but let me back up a minute it's like welcome to adulthood well, Daniel. welcome to adulthood buddy <laughs> <laughs> but let me back up so luckily we were heading in to pick up my wife who was like nine months pregnant at that time luckily she wasn't on the boat when that happened because mm. it was right in that same time frame and you know she was due in like two weeks later so I just had this massive traumatic experience happen and then I'm about to be a dad and just lost all our money all our savings excuse me and so we we were trying to finish the rest of the season make it work so we ended up leasing a boat going through all this didn't really pan out i ended up with a big yacht at the end of it <laughs> you remember that <laughs> that the i was sugar loaf dude the sugar loaf <laughs> that i was just we we're using that boat to live off of while we fished this really tiny boat 
uh, that had no liveaboard space, but then didn't catch much more fish. At the end of the season, I was stuck with this yacht, making all these payments with money I didn't have, trying to sell it. Uh, right, because you, you guys needed somewhere to live because the boat you bought to finish the season wasn't didn't have living quarters on it. So it's like, hey, we're gonna buy this yacht and uh, we'll, we'll live there and we'll take it with us where we fish and then we'll fish on this jitney is what it's called. It's a smaller boat. Exactly. And, and then you can finish out the season and hopefully yep. recoup some of your losses, right? Yeah, and after that whole experience, I, lo I mentally lost the drive to even catch fish that year, you know, just because you have to be mentally on it too. And I was just like, man, this sucks. Like, I don't want to be fishing anymore, basically, like uh -huh. risking my life. And my wife had just had her baby. I was there for like three days after the birth. And I'm like, all right, peace out. You know, I gotta go Gosh, fish dude. for another month, which in our culture is totally normal. That mm -hmm. was like just how things work. So to me, that was normal just to be like, all right, you're good with the baby <laughs> mm -hmm. and head out and was gone for, you know, missed the first month of, of Aiden's life basically and came back but kind of that whole experience and everything made me realize like i don't necessarily want to risk my life every day just for the sake of making money mm -hmm. it became this thing where it wasn't i didn't feel necessarily defeated i i still felt like i could do well and like exceed in that area but i was like i just i want something better mm -hmm. for myself and my family mm -hmm. uh, and a new way uh, to make money and i feel like this is a good time to transition to where we you were having some similar thoughts. Yeah, so my daughter was born um, in the end of January. Come May is when my fishery started, I'd go fishing. And so by the time it was getting toward the end of the season, I was sitting on my boat. Uh, it was a crappy day, it was dark, it was gloomy, it was rough weather. Um, you know, and you're surround, you see other boats when you're out there. And I, I saw this old guy out there fishing all alone getting to the end of the season morale is low at that point this is when like Super. a lot of the crews get in fight with cattle like all all the craziness kind of starts to come out and you just you just want to get off the boat and be done and i saw this guy just like self-medicating like he's drinking he's fishing it's like the middle of the night and i'm sitting here i'm like dude it's like what am i what am i doing like is that going to be me and then i started thinking about um you know my wife and my daughter eleanor and i realized like I had been gone for four of the seven months of her life. And I'm like, dude, that's over half her life. Like, <laughs> what am I doing? And I remember, I think that was the, like, the, that was the night before I quit for the season. Cause you can stick it out, you can grind, you can like milk every penny you can out of the fish that show up. Um, but it gets less and less worth it cause there's less and less fish as the season comes to an end. And so, you know, people quit at different times and I, I just, I think I called it quits. Um, and then we, you know, we're close friends in this, you know, obviously I married your daughter. We had done some traveling, some really fun stuff. My and sister, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Did I say daughter? <laughs> you said your daughter. So your sister. Okay. Uh, but anyways, we, we have this thing that in some circumstances is so beautiful and awesome and I'm actually grateful for every single day that I spent fishing and the experiences and the lessons it taught me and the opportunities it gave me and you know even the stuff growing up with, with my parents and, and you know jumping into fishing like I don't have a criticism against people who do that against my parents against your parents against totally. the culture as a whole I think at some point we just knew it it wasn't for us and it wasn't going to work with our next season of life which yeah. was marriage you know starting a family and just learning to uh just be 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 responsible and, and feel like you're not risking yeah, so much totally and part of this journey too when we're kind of realizing all this we we're starting to learn a lot about finding something you're passionate about that you can do the rest of your life and uh -huh. make money from it. So even if that meant making a little less money, you're still being mm. doing what you're passionate about, providing for your family, you're able to spend time with them. So that was important to us. But I remember remember this moment where I, I read the book, uh, Think and Grow Rich. I don't know if you guys have heard of it or read it before, but I, I had this moment in my head where I was like, dude, 
My whole life I never thought I could be rich. I thought this is exactly how things had to look to just get by and provide and like mm -hmm. live a pretty good lifestyle. But after reading that book, it changed my whole belief system of like, oh, it's actually possible for me to mm -hmm. have wealth and have money, doing things I love, and actually it's more viable to, to have lots of wealth doing the things I love than it is from fishing. Mm -hmm. Because the business world in itself, there's so much more opportunity than there is just for, if I would have continued that career mm -hmm. path for fishing. And I think I shared the book with you and you got yeah. all pumped with it. And we were starting to do well, a lot of videos and yeah, stuff. Yeah, so, so on the fishing boat, on the travels, I, I loved having a camera on me. You, you did as well. Yeah. And we're like, dude, well, we love making videos. Um, I, and we both kind of shared that belief and that epiphany that we could shape our destiny. We could, um, you know, we could, we could be wealthy doing something different. We didn't have to follow the exact formula that we see here in town. And so we're like, well, screw it, dude. Let's just, let's just start making videos. Let's start a video production company. Yeah. And we jumped into it with the belief and didn't know where to start. But I think what's most important is that we took the first step because totally. it led us to where we are now. That's where so many people get caught up is overanalyzing the market or like, should I do it? Should I not? But for us, it was a matter of just taking that step, even believing too that that's actually going to be very successful. Like we 100% mm -hmm. thought we we're going to build the biggest video marketing agency in Alaska and it's, we're going to fly all over doing all these crazy videos. You know, that's what we thought going into it and we're doing everything we could to make that happen, but our first year. <laughs> we were slightly mistaken. We were slightly mistaken. Because we went in, <laughs> we starved, dude. Uh, yeah, our first year, remember, it was Robbie and I, we ended up hiring an employee to help us with marketing and stuff and sell our videos. Uh, so there's three of us. Our first year, we just barely broke $100,000 in which sounds total nice. revenue, which sounds nice. Like, I know entrepreneurs are like, if I could just make six figures my first year, I'd be happy. But between three people and business expenses, startup fees, like we didn't even pay ourselves. We paid. It was ten grand for us that year. Piece. We made ten grand each. So for we the were, whole year. We were still at that point part-time fishing, right? Or did we? Quit? We had a little bit of savings. That's um, what it was. And you know, we'd maybe take something, like you know, take a, a, a small, small three job week, here and there. three week trip to go squid fishing you know maybe a month here maybe That's something right. like that yeah and uh dude i feel like at, at least for today's episode we kind of wrap it up here because we entered into this place where we had belief we took the step of faith but stuff got really really hard for a, for a while and that's kind of where I want to bring Patrick into the story. Yeah, that sounds right. Really um, and we'll pick it up with, you know, the video production thing. And then how do we go from that to becoming a really freaking good e-commerce marketing agency? agency. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Let's jump in next time, then. Hope you guys are enjoying the story so far. Uh, like we said, we're going to pick it up and continue the story um, as soon as... Get Patrick week. on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. See ya. See ya.